Uh, now it's my pleasure to, to introduce Ricardo Maggi, who is a molecular biologist in North Carolina and working with a vet lab uh, team. Uh, and he will show us the role of Bartonella that could be also a, a, a crypto infection responsible for many animal and probably also human diseases. So thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Dr. Peroni. Thank you, the committee, for inviting me here, and especially for, uh, to Dr. Lambert for choosing uh, this picture, uh, because I think it represents exactly what, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, trying to find a needle in a haystack. And I think it's exactly what I will need uh, as an introduction. Yep. Um, so, uh, I'm going to not talk about the clinical aspect. I'm not going to talk about treatment. I'm not going to talk about prevalence. I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, different features that the pathogens show or have. Um, in order to show that uh, my perception in regard of how to deal with infection diseases, especially the vector borne ones, are uh, to look the environment under the bacteria, in this case, uh, perspective. Uh, not from the host uh, point of view. So what defines a really good ideal stealth pathogen? Well, first one should be uh, ideally bloodborne in order to be able to be transported in and out from the host and actually inside the host to different cells. Uh, it should induce uh, chronic infection in order to persist for a long time. It doesn't matter if you are just a spike in time, but if you can subside and exist for a very long time inside the host, uh, that will be a really good opportunity in order to uh, propagate and stay there without being noticed. Uh, ideally also, it will be uh, facultative intracellular because the problem then is like uh, for rickettsia, leukemia, and plasma, they have a specific cell type that they are residing in. Um, so if I'm trying to uh, look for them or treat them, I know where to look. But if they are inter uh, facultative intracellular, they could get in and out uh, without being a single niche, uh, the, the single location. And eventually, uh, if I could actually do it in m multiple different cell types, it's going to be much better. Uh, another feature is that I don't want to be discovered. I want to be stealth, quiet. And if I could do some immunomodulation, basically cheat on an immune system, it's going to be much better. Obviously, uh, single host is not a good idea. Uh, multiple hosts is much better. So I have the different alternatives of being plastic in my adaptation uh, as, a, as a pathogen and trying to be jumping from one type of host, um, one species to other one, without any problem. But also, if I could be also uh, multivectorial, not attached to a single kind of vector like a tick or a flea or a sunfly, uh, much better because I'm going to have much more chances if I start combining all these features uh, in order to be transmitted and be persistent in nature and in different hosts without any problem. And finally, ideally, uh, I will not need a, 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 a vector. Uh, and if I could be also transmitted directly by formites, by blood, by saliva, any kind of fluid, much better either because uh, actually I don't need somebody, a shuttle, that could actually move it from one place to the other one. So when I'm going to introduce this Bartonella, all of you know the name at least. Um, so I'm going to try to present them uh, to you in a way, in, in the way I'm looking at it. Uh, Bartonella is an alpha protobacteria, it's a short pleomorphic rod, um, belongs to the Rhizobialis, it's a little bit different from the other alpha proteobacteria like rickettsia, anaplasma, this uh, neo rickettsia. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is that this feature uh, is different from any other typical bacteria. Typical bacteria divide every 20 minutes, 40 minutes. This bacteria, this group, divide every 24 hours. I always gave the same example that if somebody sitting near me and is E. coli, and I am Bartonella. If you return tomorrow at this time, you're going to have about 10 to the 15 copies of him or her and just two of me. So that's a big difference in regard to the time and the numbers we are talking about when we're talking about division time. 
And again, uh, intracellular, facultative uh, intracellular, and those are at least the tissue that we know Bartonella could be residing in. Just to give you an idea in regard of the map of the bacteria, Bartonella is up here. Uh, it's very, the, the closest related one is Brucella that you know, and Liberobacter, for those of you that know something about uh, agriculture and uh, or you like uh, um, orange juice or something like that, this is a typical pathogen or related to the citro uh, issue, citrobacter uh, infection. Um, but it's causing also of the Rickettsia and Aplasma Arlichia. And one of the big problems is that you normally, as an orthoprotobacteria, associate that the treatment for one is equal to the treatment for the other one, and it's a big mistake. Uh, Borrelia obviously is here, just to give you an idea how distinct are these two groups of organisms. But I'm going to tell you about a little bit of this, the history behind um, Bartonella. The first Bartonella I discovered was Bartonella basiliformis. And it was not until an outbreak in 1875 that killed about between 7,000 uh, 7, and 10,000 railroad workers in uh, north of uh, Peru, uh, that this bacteria at least uh, keep the attention of the physician, especially two, Carrion, that the name of the disease was Carrion disease because of him, uh, that he saw that those that were not dead because of hemolytic anemia after the, uh, getting the infection, we developed what is called the verruga peruana, the, the Peruvian wart. And trying to prove that it was an infective agent, he uh, stick a needle inside one of these verruga, he injects himself, and he proved by dying seven days later that it was an infective agent. Uh, that's passion, uh, but not the best way to do science. Uh, soon after, uh, Barton Thompson um, was able to isolate uh, the Bartonella. They call it Bartonella basiliformis, and the name of Bartonellosi was born. No later than that, in the World War II, there were one disease that pulled out of fight about one million troops in both sides of the conflict. Uh, the disease was called trench fever, huh? and it was uh, characterized by fever, weakness, uh, that was completely relapsing every five or six days. It was not until 50 years later that the etiological agent was uh, discovered, and it was named Bartonella Quintana, Quinto, because of the five-day relapsing uh, characteristics. And looking backward, obviously, uh, has been found that in one third of the re retreating truth, for example, from Napoleon when we went back to, uh, from Russia, or a uh, guy who was uh, buried for 4,000 years uh, in, in France, uh, that that bacteria was, it's not something new, it's something that was uh, already uh, among the humans for a long, long time. The third species is the one that you most, the most of you know, Bartonella Hensley. It was not until the HIV epidemics that this uh, bacteria, this bug, Bartonella, actually exists. Um, the typical manifestation was what is called Cascara disease, uh, with uh, classic manifestation, lymphadenopathy, headaches, chill, backache, but a typical manifestation in about 20% of the patients and in people that are HIV positive uh, were developing bacillary angiomatosis, peliosis, hepatitis, endocarditis, and eventually you can die of it. Uh, so given that three guys that were until 1993, if I remember, we have all of these ones. So as you see, we have a plethora of different species. The one in red are the ones that are associated with human diseases. So you choose the one you want. So we have a multiple, a plethora of different species. And on top of that, we have a plethora of different reservoir hosts uh, as the ones that are depicted here. We have typical groups. These ones are the ones that at least I was able to test and, and, and find some different burton species, but at, at, at least uh, typical reservoirs. As again, as I mentioned, one of the good characteristics of a, an ideal uh, pathogen, a stealth one, is to have multiple hosts, but also multiple vectors. It's different from what is normally accepted as a Borrelia, that is only transmitted by ticks, but Borrelia could be also transmitted by different insects, from bedbugs, sunflies, fleas, cat, 
body laws, and potentially other ones. But also, uh, vectorial transmission is not necessarily uh, a requirement for the transmission. Most of you, or probably some of you, have been reading about the uh, infection of uh, Bartonella because of a blood transfusion, organ transplant, or as it has been defined again as a Bartonella Hensley, cascar disease, meaning that um, an animal bite or scratch was able to transmit the pathogen. In regard of the vector transmission part, um, there are three different stages or phases that are now more or less um, in common accord in regard of what it could happen. The first one is the dermal phase uh, that involved the invasion of uh, lymphatic capillaries and blood capillaries. Uh, the lymphatic phase uh, with recruitment of lymphocytes in order to start doing some inflammation uh, and, and recruiting. Uh, in invasion of macrophages and able to start circulating in the lymphatic system. And finally, the vascular phase, the, the one that we normally are able to have access to, basically the blood, uh, in, where, in which the Bartonella is able to invade uh, endothelial cells and red blood cells. And I want to point out on the, this one specifically, because one of the big problems with Bartonella, remember Bartonella Quintana, the second I mentioned, that is Quintana because of the five-day relapsing fever, where this five relapsing fever is associated with the systemic in and out uh, presence of these bacteria in the bloodstream. One of the big problems on that one is uh, there are two big most important characteristics in regard of why Bartonella is really hard to detect or trace. The first one is it's relapsing. So basically, it's not blood, the, the primary a place where the bacteria is going to be. The second one is that uh, this, the bacteria is only able to replicate in red blood cells. It's not replicating in any of the other cells that I'm going to show you later. So that represents two big problems. The first one is if you take a blood sample, it, it's not going to most likely be representative of if you have the bug or not in your system. The second one is that if the bacteria is because you are treated with antibiotics and the bacteria is not traveling in the, in the bloodstream, then you don't know exactly where to look because you have plenty, a plethora of different organs or type of cells that that bacteria could be hiding in. So those are some of the examples, some of them in vivo, some of them in vitro, uh, in which Bertolina could actually invade and stay there for a long, long time. The good thing in regard of that one that is that is set for erythrocytes, they are not able to multiply inside. But they are able to stay uh, quiet, but stay. So that is a model of a couple of models that are proposed in regard of how Bartonella is able to invade different cells. The first ones involve a bad A and a T4 secretion system, like many other bacteria, with some effectors injecting there that involve the rearrangement of the cytoskeleton in order to uh, create what is called an invasome, and literally is a recruiting from the outside different bacteria, uh, different members of bacteria, in order to literally get into the cells. Other uh, uh, mechanisms in regard of the BEPS or the Bartonella uh, associated protein is the, the induction of uh, inflammation, and through a receptor type and in, in, in kinase cascade, also. Um, uh, uh, surveys the immune system and the division of the cells, including cell proliferation. That characteristic allows the bacteria not just to stay there, but also create and, 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 and recruit more cells, be able to invade those cells, and be able to actually to travel by other means than the bloodstream. Uh, what are the big difference? What are the challenges? And I, I want you to pay attention to this number because numbers matter, and that's my reference in regard to the needle in the haystack. You have two different type of reservoirs, the typical reservoir and the accidental reservoir. Uh, the, the typical reservoir, and I'm, I'm going to use two examples here, so the cat and the cow. The cat for Bartonella Hensley and the cow for Bartonella bovis. In both cases, you have literally between thousands and millions of bacteria per microliter of blood. So it's easy to detect, it's easy to isolate, and I could tell you that probably if you take uh, five cats, at least in 
endemic region, uh, and you bleed the five cats and you put uh, this blood in a blood agar plate, just to mention in a simple method, four of the five cats are going to be positive. If I do a PCR of the cow blood, especially the, 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 the one for meat, not for dairy, uh, probably 80 to 90% of them are going to be positive for Bartonella bovis. Uh, and they are not wagging the, the tail uh, like the dog, but they are happy and they show absolutely no symptom, no problem having their own Bartonella because they were adapted to that particular species. But it's completely different when, you were, when we're talking about accidental host. In accidental host, uh, as is logical, they are not adapted, and you need just a few bacteria, a few members, in order to induce pathologies. I could tell you that if uh, I have literally uh, hundreds of thousands of bacteria, but on a hensley, just to say something in a cat, the cat is going to be healthy like a normal cat. But if I put just a few of Bartonella vincona vercofi, which is a typical Bartonella in dogs, that cat is going to be as sick as you can imagine. So different species have their own uh, pre-adapted bacteria, and they are not dealing well when they become an accidental host for another species that do not co-evolve eventually uh, together. So what are the problems on that one? Why these numbers are important? It's because those represent the challenges for detection. Uh, we were talking yesterday uh, about the molecular detection. Uh, I, I'm a molecular microbiologist, so for me, the molecular part is more important than the serological part and anything else. But no technique, and, and yesterday somebody asked me, or today, somebody asked me, what is the best technique for detecting Bartonella? All of the above. Because each technique, even though you are comparing apples to oranges when you talk about molecular serology and micro, micro mean isolation, uh, you're talking different things in regard of the characteristics of the bulb. Uh, you need the three, the combination of three, in order to have a more or less realistic picture if you are infected or not, or your patient is infected or not. The problem with the PCR, obviously you need enough DNA in order to detect it. There is a threshold, and, and, and this is another message that I'm always trying to deliver every single time that I invite to talk about Bartonella. That is not technique in this planet. That is going to be 100% yes or 100% no. The gray areas in which this technique, the threshold of detection, if you want, is so large, the gray area, that sometimes it's more important to understand that one than the true yes or the true no. So that is no technique that is going to be 100% foolproof, okay? So deal with it. Uh, again, the PCR is the most common molecular technique. Uh, the problem is with relapsing bacteremia, if the bacteria is not there, you detect nothing. And if it is in very low numbers, you detect nothing either. Uh, fish, which is uh, basically the, the, the molecular fish, basically using probe in order to, for a tissue or something to stick into and see if that probe lies somewhere, meaning that the bacteria DNA at least there, is not an efficient either because you need the bacteria there. And the second one is uh, you need to go through the host cells and the, the bacteria cell in order to stick this piece of DNA, with, which is tagged with, by a fluorescent dye that you can eventually see later. The culture is really hard. And the reason why is because Bartonella doesn't like to grow uh, anywhere except blood cells, okay? So many meters are available. Not all of them are uh, equally efficient in order to do so. And it's depending, again, on how much bacteria you put there, because no matter how good the media is, uh, when they transition between the host blood to a media, again, no matter how good that media is, they are going to die. 99% of them are going to die because they need to adapt to the new media. And if you don't have enough, 99% of them mean that you are going to have nothing to grow, okay? There is no problem with cats, again, with thousands of copies, or thousands of bacteria per microliter because even if they die 99.99%, you have enough survival in order to grow. But if you go in with one bacteria per ml and you put a ml and 99%, in this case, all of the, the single bacteria is going to die, you have nothing to grow. So that is not a proof that it was negative, okay? Um, and again, cultures, plates, extremely low sensitivity. Uh, they don't like to grow in solid media, believe me. I, I went there many, many, many times. And the problem with the liquid culture is that normally it's an 
in-house kind of testing. So every single lab that do that kind of thing, like my one, has their own recipe and cooking uh, thing, okay? Serology. Uh, we were talking yesterday about serology, and there were some in and out in regard to the serology for Bartonella. Um, unfortunately, commercially available, there are two antigens of the 45 species that I showed you before. On top of that, Bartonella Hensley, let, let, let's blame one species only as the representative of these bi bad guys. There are nine different groups of Bartonella Hensley, different strain types. And each one of them has their own characteristic in regard of exposure over other membrane protein, antigenic response, and growing characteristic. And I'm talking about a single species, okay? Bartonella Hensley. Uh, there are some attempts, we are working on that also, in order to develop something a little bit more intelligent in order to choose proteins or peptides in order to use an ELISA, as I call it, a pregnancy test, uh, that is going to be fast uh, and furious in order to be able to embrace most of the species if there is any immune response from the host, okay? So what we are working on, what we were working in the last 15 years. Uh, basically, on the top part is the detection method, basically a diagnostic tool, trying to develop a combination of diagnostic tool in order to facilitate the clinician's uh, life in order to have something that is more reliable uh, in, in order to say yes or no for Bartonella presence. And the second one is what to do once you know, because it, it's useless if I know that it's there, if I don't know how to treat it, or if there is something, uh, there is consequences if the treatment fails, uh, what is going to be the prognosis in regard of that bacteremia, that infection on, for a long time. Uh, Talking about the molecular part, you know the conventional, uh, we choose the ITS, the region between 16 and 23S, because it's the most variable of all. There is a close or very relative close called mesorisovion, uh, even in molecular grade water, that if you use 16S, there is not the most difference between that group, that genus, and Bartonella in order to differentiate. Somebody yesterday mentioned that somebody blamed tap water being with Bartonella. Who was that? There were something, well, it, who did the statement or who, who said that, it was not wrong. Uh, one of the, my first challenges when I joined NC State, uh, North Carolina State University, for developing diagnostic tool for Bartonella was exactly evaluate what has been done, what is failing, and what is next. And one thing that I found out early is that the typical, what is called the HESCA primers, the HESCA primer for the detection of Bartonella was able, were able to amplify mesorisovian and some other risovialis uh, species. Uh, unfortunately, the DNA of these bugs are also in the, any molecular grade water you can buy. So I received for a year after the publication of this, uh, the, as they called yesterday, the good, the, the bad, and the ugly, uh, I, I published those results and said, well, look, guys, uh, be careful. I received phone calls and I said, oh, that's why we have so many positives. Uh, on that time, I'm talking about 16 years ago. Uh, sequencing was a little bit expensive still. Uh, so nobody, the, the people saw a ban in the gel and assumed that it was a positive. And that's why there were so many uh, positive for Bartonella. Okay. Um, soon after the convention of PCR, it was uh, the real time, either as a cybergreen or tagman base. It gave us an edge in regard of being able to quantify, which was really good. Uh, that's why the numbers that I showed you previously. And another thing is that we were able not to see with the naked eye as in a jail, but through a camera, much deeper, meaning much more sensitive than before. What we are working right now is a new technique. It's five, six years old, uh, which is called digital PCR. Digital PCR basically is a type of PCR that mix conventional and real time, but it do it through a partition of the PCR, the actual PCR mix, in literally tens of thousands of the independent drops. The advantage on that one is that product that could inhibit uh, or uh, produce a low sensitivity in regard of the amplification, if the target is there, is not happening here. So you have basically the same sensitivity that you have in a qPCR, in a, a real-time PCR, but you don't have the inhibitory problem 
for a compound that could actually kill the PCR reaction, like hemoglobin, or if you have too much DNA in a reaction, that could actually inhibit the amplification or the, 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 the construction of these many copies. These techniques is excellent when you are dealing with tissue. And one of the big problems with tissue is that you have too much DNA from the host, normally, and you cannot put too much DNA. It's one of the things that too much of a thing is not a good thing. Uh, in a PCR reaction because you are going to have absolutely nothing. So you cannot use qPCR or conventional PCR. You have to dilute the sample, blah, 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 blah. You lack sensitivity. With this technique, you can put as much as the tissue DNA you want because this one has the advantage of not being inhibited by the quantity of DNA at the end. The other thing is that a different of the qPCR or real-time PCR, this provides an absolute quantification. Real-time PCR is a relative quantification. You need to put some standard, create a calibration curve, and guess or uh, estimate more of the concentration. This one is a direct, absolute quantification of whatever bug you have. The other advantage on this one is that you can actually track mutation. One other thing that I'm going to show you is that we are working with the association between Bartonella and cancer, especially two type, type of cancer. Emangiosarcoma in dogs, which is a really bad cancer type for the dogs because they die, and uh, breast metastatic, metastatic uh, sorry, uh, cancer for humans. We know there are some mutations that are associated with Bartonella infection, and we're tracking that one using this technique because, again, we can actually differentiate a mutation, uh, one mutation in 100,000 copies. Okay? Cultures. I mentioned that, well, uh, uh, Solid culture in plates is really bad. We developed a long time ago, like uh, five, 10 years ago, uh, liquid culture based in an insect cell media. So because of the bacteria used to reside in vectors, we use an insect-based media in regard of recreating the environment of the cell, uh, insect cells. Maybe we are able to get something better than normal culture. Work for some of the species, 18 of the 45. I know it's not a good rate, but at least it's is something, something better of what has been done. As you see the cascade here, those are the uh, per sample is all the testing that we are doing because, again, not all the Bartonella has been created equal. I'm not talking about just species, I'm talking about even strain. I have strains of Bartonella Hensley that grow in 24 hours, and, and you have thousands of copies uh, immediately, and in another one you need to wait seven days in order to have something similar. I'm talking about the same species, different strains. So not all the bacteria have been created equal, so we need a, a fan of different testing points in order to see when we are picking that grow that you can actually see here in relative numbers in order to overcome the limit of detection of the technique you are using, being conventional, being real time, being the digital PCR. Okay. Um, in regard of the another form of testing, we are dealing with serology, uh, mostly with two forms. One is IFA. Again, there are only two antigens available commercially for the 45 species of Bartonella currently known today. And if you are curious enough, I have one slide at the end. I am not going to present it, but it's going to show you that Bartonella Hensley, depending on the strain you are using, you are going to have a positive or negative result for someone who is actually Bartonella Hensley positive by any mean, culture, PCR, whatever you want, okay? So it's, it's a big problem. We have our own cultures. We have our intracellular culture of at least um, nine different species and strains. So we have a pretty good potpourri of the most common, at least human or dog and cat pathogens in order to screen for, but it's a long way for to get the 45 that I showed you before. Uh, we are also working, uh, that, that is uh, several publications that show that, unfortunately, the commercial available, that which again, the rest are only for two species, are from blood agar grown culture, uh, cultures of the bacteria. And the epitope expression in regard of the outer membrane uh, from one bacteria that is intracellular is completely different from the one that is uh, free living. So the, the expression of that one is the one basically that the immune system is going to recognize. So it's much better to have an intracellular, and that's why we have different host cells in order to be able to infect and have a better expression of antigenic uh, properties. What we were working is um, 
you know that uh, I think one or two years ago there were these chimeric uh, constructs uh, that were aimed at an ELISA and or vaccine for Borrelia. When we were working with Richard Marconi, uh, who was the guy who was developing that kind of approach, and we were working in the same way in order to develop a potential ELISA, a pregnancy test, as they call it, uh, for detection of Bartonella. The idea behind it is that to have a quick, very comprehensive, species-wide uh, uh, kind of uh, fan in order to cast most of the species using specific peptide regions that are conserved among the different species, not just a single one. Um, we are exploring also the use of uh, different invasion and uh, recognition of cell host uh, protein uh, in, in Bartonella in, because the first response in regard to the immunosystem is going to be for the first stage of invasion. And so BIR8, for example, PAP31, uh, BADE, those genes that are trigger and uh, ribose switch when the bacteria transition from the flea, for example, to the mammalian host, uh, they are both. So we are looking at those ones in order to, say, to see if those uh, virulent genes, if you want, virulent proteins, uh, can be used for recognition and uh, immuno, uh, as immunodominant uh, antigens. Uh, we're working with antibiotics, and I'm going to, uh, and there was a, a, a lot of presentation regarding the useless of a single antibiotic uh, when you are treating most of the vector bone disease, especially Borrelia. Uh, but the number I'm going to show you here is something that I pulled out last night. Uh, we, in different, uh, since we are trying to understand how the bug behave inside the cells, we are looking at the cascade of different kinases and everything just to see how the mutation happened in the host cells and all these interesting things. But one of the most important ones is just also trying to see what we can do when the cell, the bacteria is inside the cell, how we can actually treat. Because if you use gentomycin, gentomycin in, in the bloodstream is going to kill everything that is floating as a Bartonella uh, and, and swimming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's not going to touch anything that is inside. Uh, Doxy is, uh, has been also recalled as, uh, well, if a vector-borne disease treated with Doxy, Doxy is going to kill it, and this is not true. And if you see the numbers here, uh, Dr. Sun published this year uh, that stationary phase is a big difference regard to the requirement of AMI, MIC when you compare with the log phase in regard of what is the minimum concentration for inhibition. I want you to compare this value with what we were using when we treat these infected cells. And even though we are talking about almost 10 times more or 100 times more, depending if we are talking about station phase or log, 90% uh, of them still alive inside cells. And this is not just based on uh, PCR uh, using DNA, but also uh, cDNA. So it's an, an active, they're still active and they're still, uh, I'm not saying happy because they don't smile, but uh, sort of they are very active inside cells, even though we are treating the cells. Uh, with a high, high concentration of loxy. Uh, we are working also with uh, Duke University and the Cohen Foundation in trying to find some other means of treating. Uh, and one way is obviously antibiotics. And part of the, the work we are doing in the antibiotic side is combination and delivery system in order to see if we can actually improve the efficiency of the antibiotic uh, uh, effect but also in trying to inhibit the action or the recognition of the bacteria to the cell. So we are looking at the ATP, some kinases that could actually be competing, compounds that could actually compete with the protein that recognize these two in order to compete with the bacteria and at least minimize the effect or the infection or the invasion of the cells. So basically, uh, we were screening animals and humans, and I, I'm trying to put everything together here. Uh, what we knew, like uh, 10 years ago, is that Bartonella, or the Bartonellosis in general, were involving optic uh, problems, myocarditis, uh, lung inflammation, bacillary angiomatosis, but along the way of different groups that we were working with, uh, especially family groups and uh, special target groups, we were able to find that it's not just involved with chronic fatigue, but also neurological dysfunction, as I mentioned, cancer and uh, the, the tumor formation, systemic and chronic infection. If you go for the crash crash disease, it's self-limited. Nothing happened because this, the, your immune system is going to take care of it. 
this is not true, like uh, many things in regards to vector borne diseases. Um, there is an immune modulation. I could talk about hours of Bartonella, so uh, be free of asking. Uh, one example that I always give is Bartonella Quintana, which was thought of being, uh, being the only truly human related Bartonella, which was not true at the end. Um, when you uh, infect a monkey with a specific strain, uh, the other membrane proteins are going to change along the infection process in order to cheat on the immune system. It's like uh, to say uh, they present one color and two days later another different color than uh, so far so uh, in regard to the infection. So the immune system never see the same color if you want. Uh, when we're talking about the variable order membrane protein arrangement that Bartonella Quintana is. So immunomodulation is important because it's able uh, enable the bacteria to cheat and be stealth as it's supposed to. Uh, again, skin lesions, uh, rheumatoid presentation, and current arthritis are some of them. Now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about briefly, very briefly, about another bug that I think uh, if I put uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Lambert mentioned that HIV, Borrelia borreliosis or Lyme is behind HIV. Well, uh, Bartonella is behind uh, Lyme or borreliosis. And this guy, uh, who is a hemotropic mycoplasma, is much lower in regard of the evolution, in regard of understanding what's going on with this bug. Uh, it's a molycutes, uh, the division time is not as long as in Bartonella, it's about six, eight hours. Nobody knows because nobody was able to isolate any, so uh, it's a good guess, okay? Um, it's a facultative intracellular, it was thought to be a epiedetrocytic one, but it's able to invade and divide inside the cells, okay, the red blood cells. Um, it's cell wall deficient, it's not a gram negative by definition, but it's gram negative because of the technique, okay? Um, it's not culturable, so you cannot have it free yet. Um, and can, can induce uh, hemolytic anemia. And uh, why I'm talking about that one, well, it, it's, it's clear in the phylogenetic tree, it's far on this corner, not related with Borrelia, not related with the other alpha, okay? Uh, I'm talking about this group. It's one of the, fifth, uh, the five groups of the mycoplasma group. Uh, it's the one at the bottom. Uh, those are the, the, some of the hosts that I was playing with. Some of them trapping, some of them uh, uh, bleeding and culturing in order to see what's going on, what species we have. And I'm going to present some results there and some association with human infection. They, do they have something to do with uh, some pathologies? I don't know, but at least if you don't see, you cannot associate. So the first thing is diagnose or seeing and then figure out if that scene or that present means something or not. Uh, vector tested, uh, well, uh, all of them are thought to be vectors, uh, competent vectors, um, but there is no proof yet. Uh, it could be as in Bartonella, uh, also transmitted by formites or direct transmission by bites, saliva, blood transfusion, organ transplant. Uh, unfortunately, since we don't have neither serology, neither culture, we rely basically in two techniques in order to uh, be able to detect it. One DNA through a typical PCR or uh, isothermal amplification, and blood smear, which literally sucks. Uh, because basically, uh, the association of mycoplasma, hemotropic mycoplasma with the red blood cells is very weak. So rapidly they dissociate and disappear. Uh, also, since you have to make attention, uh, it's easy to confuse with different you know, artifacts. Uh, so trying to use blood smear as your single diagnostic tool is not a good idea. Most likely you're going to fail than succeed in order to uh, see exactly what's going on. Uh, I'm going to show you some results. I, I, I told you that I'm not going to show the results, I'm lying, because I want you to see two different things. One is the prevalence in different species, and the other is the number of species. A species not as a host, the species of mycoplasma. Uh, in, the, in our group, uh, there's a big difference between uh, HA is high exposure animal, um, humans, uh, people that has uh, large contact with animals and vectors, and exposure to vectors, versus people that are not. So the percentages are very different. There are basically four different species detected in these two studies, uh, with a total of four different species totally detected in humans. 
Uh, in monkeys, we detect a new species. We call it hemomacaque because it went in macaques. So we didn't know how to call it, so we call it hemomacaque. Very simple and straightforward. Uh, the problem with this one is that those monkeys are the monkeys that have been used by two of the biggest preclinical companies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, to, to test drugs, the effects on drugs. And guess what? I have to cut five minutes. OK. Uh, so basically, uh, most of the monkeys were infected previously to the administration of whatever drug was in testing in that time with this one. So the question is, are the effect of they see from the drug, actually from the drug, or it was because they were a concomitant uh, infection of some, somebody, like mycoplasma, that could induce some immunodeficiency? Uh, uh, dogs and cats, uh, you have the species there. Uh, those are the ones that we normally tested. Uh, in the group of uh, cows and deer, uh, you see the percentages uh, pretty high. Um, and all the species that we were testing uh, between uh, uh, bats and sea lions and uh, bears, uh, I, I think the most important just to conclude is this one. The highlighted in, in red there are the ones that has been detected either by us or somebody else in humans. Normally, those people are the ones that were exposed to animals or vectors, or they were immunodeficient. So it's not for you to do anything, but just to put hemotropic mycoplasma in the back of your mind, like the monkey here, that, uh, what about mycoplasma? What about my because this guy is coming. I, I, at least this guy is going to be the next Bartonella, the next Borrelia. Uh, under my point of view, because it's completely under study, under anything, basically. Um, so basically, we detect four different mycoplasma species in people, uh, on new species in, in monkeys, uh, and we still have 10 new species in my lab that need to be characterized because we have no clue how to, uh, uh, beside characterized by some genes. Um, I'm not going to there there, but if you look into um, outbreaks, uh, I was dealing with two outbreaks uh, in the US, and it was something similar that happened in New Zealand two and one year ago uh, with dairy cows. Uh, if you're interested in chemotropic mycoplasma, look at Google chemotropic mycoplasmas and dairy cow, and you're going to find something. And I, uh, to, to, to conclude is, this is not related with Bartonella, neither with mycoplasma. Uh, this one is just to highlight that, uh, remember the number of species of Bartonella, there are 40 something, uh, and each one has their own personality, if you want, uh, behave a little bit different from the other one. Uh, those are the cycles, the normal transmission cycle uh, uh, and dynamic cycles of the toxo, Lyme, and Neurocasia ricesi. And what I'm trying to paint here is that we cannot understand a disease if we don't understand the bug. We cannot understand the bug if we don't understand how the bug adapt to different parts of the environment when that other part of the environment is part of the life cycle, okay? So try to look into the pathogen, not from the host perspective, like the victim, but from the bug point of view. Because probably you're going to have clues there in order to see or how to track it, in, in order to say at least yes or no, is present or not. Uh, so can you imagine those cycles when we start um, playing with the habitat, uh, being good or bad, uh, or when we have changes uh, because we introduce or not different species, uh, those cycles are going to be much more complicated than here. So thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have questions? Oh. Oh, thanks, Ricardo. That's a brilliant talk. Um, my question is uh, detection limit. Uh, would you mind sharing a bit of uh, detail how you calculate the detection limit on the qPCR and the digital PCR? Thank you for the question. And it's not finished yet. Uh, the digital PCR, I noticed the uh, detection limit is 0 0.2 copies per microliter. Yeah. 
See, if you total volume is 20 microliter, then you're looking at two copies per PCR reactions. Uh, so I leave it to you, sorry. No, no, no. I, 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 I like that. the idea of trying to speed up in regard of the talk is to allow you to toss question. And I think your one is one of the most important. Limit of detection. Not all the molecular testing has been created equal. Either if you want to compare conventional or qPCR or, or, or digital PCR, each one of them are different depending on the target you are using, the enzyme you are using, the machine you are using. So you cannot translate what you read in a literature and have the same result exactly in regard of how low you can go in regard of the limit of detection, first thing. So you need to adapt to whatever you have in order to optimize your reaction. This is from a molecular guy to whoever wants to do some diagnostic using a molecular tool like ampli PCR amplification. The second one is, um, depending on what you want. If you ask me which one is better, uh, all of the three. And the reason why is because the sensitivity is going to depend on the piece of DNA you are going to amplify, even if we are talking about the same gene. Uh, the same piece of gene, uh, or the same gene, could have different sensitivity depending if it's a small piece they want to amplify, different primers, let me put it simple. Different primer has different sensitivities in what they are able, they are able to amplify. Uh, good thing and bad thing of each, conventional allow you to have a chunk of DNA that is long enough in order to be able to, by sequence, know exactly what species of strain you are dealing with or if there is any change. The conventional, the, the real-time or the digital PCR are small pieces, so it's a, mostly a yes or no. Uh, it's present or not, and you can quantify it if you're interested. With the conventional, you can't. Uh, what I normally do, I use the three of them. Uh, in regard of the limit of sensitivity, I said 0 0.2. Uh, copies per microliters. It's not the microliters of the total volume, it's the microliters of the template I'm using. And I'm normally use five microliters. So it's basically the equivalent of one between one and 1.5 genome copies. Remember, the target, this one, uh, I'm targeting the ITS. The ITS is the region between 16 and 23S, okay? And it's double copy per genome. So basically, instead of one, it's one genome copy, but I have two templates of that region there. So basically, I'm looking for two blueprints of that region. Uh, but any gene is different in regard of what they are able to amplify. Every target is different. Uh, the problem with the gene, understanding gene as the, the true definition of a gene, is something that encodes for something, being RNA or at the end as a protein on inside. Evolutionally speaking, they, they, uh, Mutation cannot play much more there because it's not going to be the end product, being the RNA or the protein. So the genes are constrained in regard of differentiating species among them or strains among them or species that are close relating as a genera because the function should be the same one as a gene definition. ITS is a chunk of DNA that is in between two genes. So evolutionary speaking, we have a lot of noise. A lot of noise is really good because allow us to differentiate minute differences that has been because of the plasticity from jumping from one host and the other one. So not all the targets of the PCR has been created equal. Not all of them, even if you are targeting the same one, is going to be the same one in your lab, your lab, or your lab. You need to adjust your own recipe and tune up, basically, the technique to allow uh, or to get the best sensitivity on that one. I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, another question? Yeah. Okay. No? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, one of the things you mentioned that Bartonella is associated with uh, neuritis, and it's also, uh, I mean, I do also diagnostics in the Netherlands, but I actually never see antibodies in uh, patients who are uh, requested research because they have neuritis. So do you know which species of Bartonella is causing this in your, in your experience? In that? Okay, I'm going to give you, I, I don't know. That the answer. But let me give you two facts that are there. About 50% of a host that is bacteremic, being a cat, a dog, a human, a cow, uh, that are bacteremic that you can actually PCR and have culture are going to be negative for serology, using exactly the same species and strain. 
as your antigen. I'm talking about IFA mostly. Uh, so it's because the bacteria is able to evade the immune system or tweak uh, the immune system or hide uh, non in order not to be recognized? Probably. But if I show you, ta -da. remember that I say uh, there is one that I had at the end? Well, this one is basically a pretty cool kind of popery of things that I would like you to pay attention to. Uh, this is uh, from Sweden. It's the first time I ever uh, participate in a conference in uh, Bartonella related. And I, 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 since I don't like serology, for me this one was perfect because it was actually to my point. Those are Kaskar's disease people, uh, 58 of them, and depending on, we're talking about the same guy, Bartona Hensley, but if they use Houston 1, which is a typical <coughs> American strain of Bartona Hensley, Marseille, a typical, obviously, French. Uh, Sweden, CAT 68, I don't know why they call it 68, CAT 68, but anyway, it's there. And a typical French, one, um, German one. Depending on when the strain that was used as an antigen, those are the percentages of the immune response. So basically, if I'm using the, mostly this one is the commercial available here in Europe and here in, in the US. I'm going to have 10 or 58 or 8 or 58, depending on if, uh, which population I'm dealing with. What I'm trying to say is that, Depending on the strain you are using uh, is the result you are going to have. I use, for example, three different strains. And two of them, Houston 1 and SA2, San Antonio 2, are two American ones. Uh, but Houston 1 give me 50% of the prevalence or the positive rate that uh, SA2 is when actually I have Barton and Hensley growing or they're being detected by molecular method. This one is also pretty cool. Uh, basically, it's what I'm saying. The, the, the in-house, the long one, normally you do with the isolate you have, uh, you've been isolated uh, from the patient. So see the difference in the sensitivity, 53%, 66 percent uh, when they use the commercial one. And probably because they were buying one that has been, uh, the Houston one in Marseille, and this one was probably in Sweden, uh, Netherlands. So they were not using the right antigen in order to see if there is truly an immune response uh, or it was a, and antibodies present or not there. And the other one is what I just mentioned. Uh, those are the results in regard to the variability, in regard to sensitivity, when you have inside the cell versus when you have inside. A uh, huge range of uh, sensitivity when you compare one with the other one. And that's all of them has something to do with the order membrane expression of the Bartonella on that particular time. So it's not the right one, the one that had been exposed by, uh, to, for the immune system to recognize, uh, to, is going to be negative. So to answer your question, I don't know. I don't know because, again, it could be strain variation, could be species variation, it could be simply that it's uh, another species that we have no idea of. I would like to, to, to ask you uh, about um, the, the involvement of Bartonella species in the development of melanoma because uh, I know that you, you and your colleagues worked on that. Uh, in regard to the melanoma, I don't know. Uh, we are working right now with, again, two type of uh, tumors. Uh, one, the mangosarcoma, that we found a high prevalence, over 70% in tissue and nothing in blood, which means that it's not in circulation and you detect in blood. And the other one is uh, mammary uh, cancer, uh, that we saw a strong association and trigger some of the receptor typical of that one. What are the mechanisms? We are working with Duke uh, University, the oncology group, in order to, basically, it's actually on, underway, uh, infecting in my lab uh, mammary cells in order to see what is the progression, what are the mutations that take place, in order then to follow those trends and those mutations uh, with digital PCR on time, in order to see what, what, what could be the, the, the outcome in regard of the infection. Now, as talking as an intracellular part, not as an outer infection. A systemic infection. Thank you so much.